but it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Now, often when we introduce speakers, we, um, we read a bio, and all of you uh, have the capacity to read, so you can probably read the little bio there. I just want to share one or two things about Brent, because he happens to be a friend of mine, and I did tell him I was going to tell a story he doesn't want shared, but we won't do that. Um, I've been in this community for a little over five years, and very early on when I came to Concordia, uh, there was various people that I was encouraged to meet because they'd help shape what happens in our program, and one of those was Brent Tyken. Uh, also, what we did very early is ask Brent to participate not just in his ideas, but in his, in his time. So for many years now, Brent has been teaching a class about entrepreneurship, um, and has been part, an important part of our curriculum in the Offit School. Also, he's someone who I personally can routinely go to to get advice on about where we're heading. And in a community like ours, uh, and all of higher ed tends to be a little insular. So when we talk to each other, we often say that's a great idea because that's how we think inside the, this community. And what Brent is able to do for, for us, me particular, but I think for this community, is offer advice uh, from an outside perspective, but also someone who has deep affinity and love for this college. So I think we've been blessed in the Offit School by having um, Brent as part of what we do. Also, for those of you who don't know Brent and, his, and how he impacts our community, um, he's a young he, as a younger person, he's a, he has been a leader in Fargo-Moorhead for lots of years. Some of the things that I find most intriguing and interesting about Brent is that as well as being a dad who does all the things he needs to do to do that and sustain a family, be a great husband, if you want to see what most motivates Brent, besides winning the deal, because he loves to win at business, is having a company that's a great place to work. So my guess is if you ask, let's, let's put the list down of the things that give you the greatest pleasure, the fact that overwhelmingly people say Sundog is an incredible place to work, that's going to be top of the list. Now, if I'm working in an organisation, I want to work for someone who has that attitude, that their primary goal is to stay in business, to make some money and do other things, but essentially it's about a great place to work. That's why I think there's no more... Uh, obvious person to, to introduce these lessons of leadership today. So with no further ado, I'm going to call on Brent Tyken. Well, thank you. Um, <clears throat> it is a, it's an honor and pleasure. It always is to be able to speak um, to a group like this about culture, something that I'm extremely passionate about and, and trust. Um, as Greg mentioned, I do have a deep passion for this, uh, for this school. I've, I'm a 92 graduate. So when, when Dr. Dovery um, contacted me and, uh, you know, there's, you, I never, you don't forget that voice. Um, <laughs> Brent, yes, this is Dr. Dovery. God, did I, am I in trouble again? <laughs> well, I have a proposition for you. And so he explained what he, um, would come, what he would like me to come and speak to. And I thought that would be, that would be wonderful. I'd love to do that. It's something that I'm, I'm extremely passionate about. For those of you that don't know, Sundog, we're a um, local, we're a uh, Fargo-based marketing and technology company. We have offices in Fargo. We have offices in Denver. Uh, and Minneapolis as well. Um, we have about 105 people. We are, uh, uh, much of what we do is custom software development, web software development. Um, we have several large healthcare organizations as customers. We did not touch healthcare.gov. <laughs> Just wanna set that, be clear about that. Um, uh, and that's one of those small things of which I'm thankful for. Um, but, um, and I guess just for the sake of our country, let's hope I can stop using that joke by the end of November. Um, so we're, we're a, uh, web, web comp we're a marketing and technology company. A lot of what we do is kind of the back end, the, the, uh, the analytical part of marketing. Um, we do some creative work. So we have this combination of highly, highly technical people, highly, highly creative people. Um, and trying to bring those two minds together is often a challenge. Um, 
in, in, it's been my experience that in our industry, um, if you're going to have a company that's based in Fargo, you need to have a competitive advantage. Um, I've always believed that um, a way for us to have a competitive advantage is to create a, a cr create a great culture and a great place to work. Um, and so we've been extremely focused in, on that, and it's been a passion of mine over the last three or four years. Um, it's given me an opportunity to come and speak to larger audiences about exactly what we do to build that culture, um, what we do to build trust in an organization. And so um, what I want to do today is, is share with you just some of the stories, uh, some of the lessons that I've learned about culture. Um, I've shared some of these stories before with other uh, speaking opportunities, but I've really focused this one today more on trust in the workplace. Um, 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 and so, so what I'll do is share with you some of the books I've read, some of the research that I've done, um, some of the stories and some of the lessons that I've learned. As we all know, um, any organization that we work for has a culture, whether you like that culture or not. Um, there is, there is a culture, and I often am asked, you know, how did you guys build that culture at Sundog? Um, how did you take it from where it was uh, 10 years ago, five years ago, to where it is today? So I hope to be able to impart or share with you some of those lessons that I've learned. Um, uh, where I'd like to start um, with this is, though, I, there's a, uh, something happened to me this week, just on Wednesday morning, and it was actually, I thought, the more I thought about it, the more I thought this is the perfect way to set, set this, um, this presentation up. So um, one of our clients uh, asked me to help uh, to, to mentor um, a young marketing professional. Um, this person, we'll call her Jane, was just getting started in her career, still going to school, uh, but had moved into a relatively um, uh, senior position, if you will, within the organization. And so the CEO, who was very, very uh, aware of culture and, um, and leadership principles, asked if I'd be willing to help nurture, mentor this individual. And I said, sure, I'd be happy to do that. And I've, I've, I've over the last year, have seen this individual, you know, hit high highs and, and very low lows, um, just in struggling with this, this role. So um, we had coffee on Wednesday morning, and uh, I, I could tell there was just this look of sort of desperation or, or uh, distress. And as soon, as soon as I sat down to start drinking my coffee, she looked at me and, and just kind of unloaded and, and said, you know, I, I'm, I'm frustrated. I don't know where to go with this. Uh, I feel like uh, I'm being micromanaged. I feel like what I was hired to do, I don't get a chance to do. So, you know, the expertise that I have, I don't get to apply that on a daily basis. Um, they're questioning decisions that I make, so when I come to work, they want to know what I'm doing. Um, there's a, there's just a, 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 you know, sort of a lack of, uh, a lack of trust in, in what I'm doing, and I'm really, um, I'm frustrated. And I, I, you know, said, well, you know, as, as, the, as the conversation went on, I tried to kind of challenge and, and channel her and say, well, have you done this and have you done that? And ultimately, I think what, what, you know, what the, where the conversation ended and where, when she kind of, um, in, me, in, my, in my own mind, kind of dropped that, that final bomb was when she said, you know, I think even if, um, if management uh, were to change, I don't know that I would trust them. I don't know that something would change, even if they said that it would. Um, and at that point, I just kind of realized, you know, this person has really, has really quit. They're, they're completely disengaged from the organization. It's, and it's, it's a tough thing to see. It's a tough thing to hear. And I think we've all heard that before. You know, even if management told me they were going to make changes, even if they promised that something here would change or something there would change, I don't know that I believe them. And um, what, we've, what I've found over the, over the last few years that we've really focused on, on culture at, this, at our organization, um, if, you, if you look at the, the, the data, um, people will tell you that there's been an engagement issue or a trust issue um, over the last decade. There's just a complete erosion in trust. Uh, employees typically just don't trust management and what they say. So, um, you know, I, I'll get back to the story a little, a little later, but I, it was one of those moments where I just realized when somebody says that, it's just, it, 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 it breaks my heart because you know they've checked out. Um, and it certainly has happened to me before too. Um, and, you know, I know it will happen again, but what we're trying to do is create an environment at Sundog where, where when we say something as a manager, as a leader, when I say something, uh, the people that work there, our team members, believe what comes out of my mouth. They believe there is change that will happen or changes to come. So where I'm going to start 
Um, let's see if I can get this to work here. So what, what are the facts today about trust and engagement? And, and just so you know, the way I look at trust, um, I, I see trust and engagement as sort of a chicken and the egg thing. Trust, trust leads to engagement. Engagement is, is it leads to trust within an organization. If engagement as an employer, if engagement is the, the key indicator or the key measurement that you're looking for to determine whether or not your employees are happy, I would argue that trust is the currency of any organization. Without trust, you're just not going to get engagement. And without engagement, you're not going to have happy employees. And if you, ha if you don't have happy employees, you're going to have high, high levels of turnover and low levels of trust. So what do we know about uh, the workplace today? Again, based on, this is a, 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 a slide that I've taken from CNN Money, which is a recent um, survey on, on trust in the workplace. Um, and engagement, but we know one out of three are currently considering quitting their job. This is a stat that you'll see over and over and over again. Um, I've seen it in modern survey, I've seen it in the Great Places to Work surveys, and so it's, it's a, it's a, I think if you work in an organization where you're questioning leadership, where you're qu questioning trust, uh, where there isn't a real focus on, on culture and happiness, I think that that stat probably proves out to be fairly true. One out of three people are, are serious about quitting. Um, many of these people are kind of holding on until the economy pick back, picks back up and there are more job opportunities for them. But many of them in the back of their heads are saying, you know, I don't really like this place and as soon as things open up, I will look for another job. 17% of folks feel like they don't receive sufficient recognition. So what does recognition mean? And I think there's a misunderstanding of recognition in the workplace. Many people, leaders particularly, believe recognition means a pay increase, and it doesn't. And we've all heard how simple something like a handwritten note can be, a lunch, grabbing a cup of coffee, uh, hey, you know what, thank you for working here. We all know how important those things can be, but we often overlook the power of them. If you look at what Gen X, Gen Y, and the millennials want, they don't necessarily want more money. That is a nice thing to have, and that's part of recognition, but it is not recognition defined. Recognition is just more of that heart-to-heart, -heart, thank you for what you do. They feel like they don't receive enough of that. 67% feel they get too little feedback in the workplace. Um, for those of you ha that have read the, uh, the book Drive by, by Daniel Pink, um, he makes a, a, a great point, and I'm going to steal it from him. Um, he says that, you know, if you think about feedback in the workplace, feedback means communication. With a lack of communication, we draw our own assumptions and conclusions. When we draw our own assumptions and conclusions, we begin to distrust those that are communicating with us, right, that are in positions of leadership. With the millennials, Gen X, Gen Y, typically those generations are getting feedback constantly in everything they do every single day through social networks, with relationships they have with their friends, they are used to constant feedback. Most large organizations give feedback annually. They give it in an annual review. So you can find uh, that there you know, organizations or situations where employees may go for an entire year before they get feedback. And when they do get feedback, they're scored. Now Microsoft, as you probably, most of you have read, has gotten rid of their scoring system. So there's some arbitrary scoring system that says, out of a five, you're a two here and you're a four there. Well, why? Why didn't you tell me I was a two earlier, right? I want that feedback. And then finally, overall, 84% of employees say that they're just unhappy with their current jobs. So why? Why are, are we unhappy as an, as an employee, as a team member? Why aren't we happy? And what I found is, I, if you boil it all down, I think there are four things. Um, there's a lack of inspiration, a lack of inspiration, number one. So people want to be inspired. They want to know that they're creating more than um, a widget, that they're doing more than writing a line of code. Um, they want to know, ultimately, that they work for an organization that has a longer-term vision, and they're part of that vision. That, that's what's inspiring to them. Show me. Show me where we're going. Show me that this organization cares more than just about the, the bottom line, and show me how I fit into that. Um, there's a lack of recognition. I just talked about uh, talked about that. A lack of motivation, um, and again, stealing from um, from Dan Pink. 
he defines, uh, or he, what he argues is that what motivates the workforce today are three things, autonomy, mastery, and purpose. So if you think about autonomy, um, trust me, help, let me make my own decisions. You hired me to do a job, let me do the job. Don't micromanage, don't watch over me, don't ask me what I'm gonna do today. I will do what you want me to do, I'll show up. Just trust me. If I need to leave early, let me leave early. Give me some flexibility there. Um, mastery, um, I'm an expert, I love being an expert. What motivates me is being an expert. Personally speaking, I love being an expert on, on what I would hope, I hope I'm becoming an expert on the idea of culture. Um, I know our engineers are motivated by writing code and being an expert, uh, speaking on technology. Generation Y, X, and Millennials want to be experts and that's what motivates them. And then finally, purpose. So autonomy, mastery, and purpose. The purpose is show me what this organization stands for. Show me the values and where we're gonna go as an organization. So those are the, the primary drivers of motivation today. And when you have a lack of trust, when you take away the ability for somebody to be an expert, and then when you micromanage them, you begin to start to see this idea of disengagement happen. And when I go back to that conversation that I had with um, this young uh, executive, this is exactly what was happening. I, I, I went down the list with her and she said, yep, 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 that's exactly what's happened. If you combine all that, what you end up with is um, a lack of trust. And it's a, you know, it's a kind of a, this is, I, I, I'm looking at all the faces out here and everybody's kind of going, God, this is awful. Thanks for inspiring <laughs> us today, Brent. <laughs> but it's why we need to take trust seriously. Um, you know, there is good news here, and that is that um, we can all affect trust, we can build trust, and we can do it through building um, culture in the organization. But one more, one more, one more uh, depressing slide is if you look at why we need to take trust seriously, I think these numbers point this out. This was a study done by Deloitte in 2010. And it, it, uh, of, the, of the employees surveyed, it said, do you feel the effects of trust in your organization? And as you can see, most of them do. Again, reinforcing that number on the first slide that I showed you, one third of those folks, or roughly, are gonna look for a new job once the economy picks up. Uh, about half cite a specific loss of trust with the employer. And then what the number that really sticks out to me that I guess um, maybe I shouldn't be surprised by it, but I always am, is that a full two thirds of, a full two -thirds of the executives that took this survey agree that trust is an issue. So if two thirds agree that trust is an issue, why is, why, why, why is, <laughs> what are we doing to fix it and why is it such a, uh, why do 90% of uh, employees feel like there is a erosion of trust in the workplace? Part of it I think is that it's just really hard. Building cultures are hard. Um, you know, a lot of people, if you, um, if you think about leadership, they know that building trust is hard. They know that building a culture is hard. But I think a lot of us feel like, well, you know what, that's kind of beneath me. I don't need to build culture. I'll have other people do that. It just, it's not important for me right now to, to worry about that. Culture is an immeasurable soft skill that you can't qualify or quantify, so I'm not gonna worry about it. And unfortunately, at least in my opinion, if you're going to change culture in any organization, it has to start with the leader. They have to know who you are, who your values are, and then it can, you, can, you can work from there. Um, many of you have heard the Great, great Place to Work. Um, it's an um, organization that does a lot of work with Fortune um, 500s and Fortune 1000 companies, and you know they every year publish a, a survey of the best places to work, large organizations. And this quote came from um, that organization. So essentially, great places to work, places that have high levels of trust, they see that there is an annual return of the um, average S&P. They beat the uh, average S&P by a factor of three. Um, Stephen Covey has said that, you know, what he, he believes it's more of a factor of five. So those places that have high levels of trust, great cultures, constantly and continually beat the, uh, the rest of their peers. 
So that's the backdrop. That's all the bad news. Um, trust is an issue. Culture is an issue. There's a lack of trust. Uh, there's a lack of communication. Good news is that it's a fixable thing. Um, you know, there is a solution to this. Um, what what I've tried to do in every, in, in every time I've come out and talked about culture is I try to break it down into five things. Uh, simply, how do you envision a better culture, a, a culture where trust is given away, uh, a culture where trust isn't something that's um, necessarily calculated? Um, that's a hard thing to do. Um, when you don't know somebody, are you willing to give them trust? It's, it's very, very difficult. So how do you envision a culture that looks like that? Then if you've envisioned it, how do you build it? Right? So what, what's involved in building a culture that looks like that? How do you engage those folks? Um, that you've hired. Um, you'll hear me say time and time again, and I think this is again one of the assumptions that a lot of executive, uh, executives have made that is incorrect. I think a lot of people think engagement happens um, at a party, or engagement happens at an annual meeting, or engagement happens in a meeting room, and it doesn't. Engagement happens one person at a time. And if there's maybe one message that I can get across to anybody that leads, that leads people, if you're leading somebody, if you're leading a team, understand that engagement part happens one person at a time. How do you hire? And then finally, is it possible to measure culture or is it possible to measure engagement? Is it possible to measure trust? And I would argue that it is, okay? So, um, before I, um, I'm gonna move into this, I'll just, um, as Greg mentioned, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an ex-Cobber, a 92 grad, uh, born and raised in Moorhead, and um, have a deep, deep love for this, um, this uh, institution, this college. I played baseball here. Um, have my, my best men were um, uh, baseball players from here. have had lifelong relationships with so many, as so many Cobbers do. Um, and it really, I think, put me on a path toward where I am um, today. And so, um, from Concordia, I went to work for Great Plains Software, which of course is now Microsoft, and um, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with my story. I'll try to make this real brief, but it was at, Microsoft, or it was at Great Plains when, uh, in fact, I was with um, one of the gentlemen here, Fred Hudson, who works at RDO, and he and I were working together and kind of, uh, at the time, I think this was 93 or 1994, when the internet was just starting to uh, become something that I think people were noticing, and so we were um, trying to figure out, Fred was teaching me how to write in HTML at the time and probably thought this guy's a hopeless case. I'm <laughs> and when, when, uh, when we decided, when I decided to leave Great Plains Software, I think it was something like good luck. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, when uh, I met another gentleman um, when I was there and, and he and I decided to kind of jump off that cliff together. So in one year I um, started Sundog. Uh, built a new house, got, got married and, and uh, bought a new house. I figured if I got it all done in one year um, and, and, you know, give me a little bit more motivation to, to make sure things worked out. <laughs> um, and there's another story there. When I left uh, um, um, Great Plains, I had a great offer to stay from, from Doug, and I turned him down um, without talking to my wife, and I always say I still have the bruise on my arm to, uh, <laughs> to show that, but... There were some things that I went through um, that really kind of, um, I guess, uh, brought me to this idea that you know I I, I would I, w I wanted to leave Great Plains Software. Um, one of those was a health scare, and and uh, it's a long story, but um, I had some issues with double vision, which ultimately led me down to Mayo, and uh, was diagnosed with a growth near my pituitary gland, which was causing some problems. And it was a real scary time. Um, the neurosurgeons down there really didn't know what it was. And, you know, I was in the, the unforgettable moment throughout the entire six months was when my wife and I were in the um, neurosurgeon's office, and he just both, he looked at both of us. And my wife was frustrated. Many of you know Joe, and Joe is not one to mince words. And she just said, you know, would somebody tell us what's wrong? And he just looked at us with this sort of icy stare, and he said, I don't know what's wrong, but whatever it is, it could be fatal. You know, and you're 25. You just married, you just bought a house, and you know the whole color of the room kind of changes at that point. And you don't look at the world the same way when you get, you know, uh, when you recover, when you're, um, when you wake up from that surgery. Um, uh, and I never did, and I never have. And if you talk to my wife today, she would say that the man that I married then is a different man than I'm married to um, today. But when I was given that offer at Great Plains from Doug in his office, I'll never forget that moment. 
from Doug Burgum, um, I told him, I said, you know, I really appreciate the, 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 uh, the chance to, to stay here, but I, I'm not going to be able to look back 10 years from now. Um, and if I, don't, if I don't do this, and I'm still saying, what if, I'm not going to be able to live with myself. So risk, risk became a whole different thing to me um, at that point. As long as I had you know, health, then I felt I could just about do anything. So uh, the uh, other gentleman and I, we left, um, and I <coughs> went into writing our business plan and trying to figure out how we were going to make money and how quickly we could make money and whether or not we could eat. And so we had $2,000 and a couple of computers between the two of us, um, and we made it work. But I do remember writing the business plan, and I remember a couple of, of, of lines in the business plan that I wrote, and I, I go back to that a lot. Um, one of those in particular was, you know, um, we're gonna, we were gonna try to, the concept was we are gonna try to take the best things that we, we learned at Great Plains Software, and there were a lot of them. Um, and we were gonna bring those things into Sundog. And we are gonna try to leave the worst behind so we didn't bring Fred. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you appreciate that, don't you? Um, so we were gonna leave the worst behind, and, and, and uh, um, there, was a, there was a line that I wrote in there that said, you know, I, I think we need to, um, forget about the idea of work-life balance and, and try to make this into more like work-life integration. And what I mean by that is that, you know, we wanted to create a place where, y you know, the, you didn't get up in the morning and say, Jesus, I have to go to work. You got up in the morning and you said, hey, I get to go work today. I get to go to Sundog today. And we wanted to make Sundog a place that was just really comfortable, uh, had a really comfortable work environment that supported individuals um, in, at, at work and outside of work. So if they had to work late hours and if they really had to scramble um, at home, they could, they could be at home, but if they, you know, we needed them at work, they would be at work. And the two came together in a way that you didn't feel like you, know, you had to kind of balance both of them, you could make both of them work. And so the concept of work-life integration became um, one of our priorities. The second thing that I remember writing was um, we want to, uh, um, uh, the second thing was, I'm total, total, uh, totally lost my train of thought here. Um, we want to make Sundog a place where we build people up, that we get them to do more than they ever thought possible. And that was really important to me. And what I realized is w when, when I wrote that, that concept of building people up and getting them to do more than they thought possible, what I was really doing was writing my why. So why, do, why does Sundog is, exist? Who are we and why do we exist? Back to that idea of purpose. This is our purpose. Our purpose as an organization is to get them to do more, get our team members to do more than they thought possible. How do we do that? Well, I'm not gonna, because of lack of time, I'm not gonna go into the detail, but if you haven't read the book by Simon Sinek about why, I would, I would encourage you to read it. It will force you as a leader to think about what you really do and why you really do it. It's not to make money. It's not to grow a huge organization. It are, in our case, in my case, it's to build people up and to get them to do more than they thought possible. So some lessons in, I've learned in envisioning um, a company culture, we talked about work-life balance and we talked about building people up, but the concept of our why to build people up has gotten our folks to do more than, than they thought, thought possible. It's, got them, it's gotten them to take risk. And the concept of taking risk and the concept of building people up and getting them to do more means that you have to give trust away. You cannot keep it. And the way you give trust away is by knowing who you're hiring. And I'll get into that, concept, that, that idea of hiring in just a little bit. So um, we've envisioned, you know, we, we, I, I understand why we're in business. And I think all of our folks at Sundog understand why we're in business. It's a really critical concept that leaders must let their folks know this is who I am, this is why I'm in business, and this, these are the values of the organization. So the next step is building, and I would argue that the only way that you can really build a culture that really um, um, embraces in, um, um, engagement and trust is to have a values-based organization, a values-based culture. This is Home Plate. Um, one of our local artists, Kay Hildy, we've commissioned her to paint. Um, we, every time, um, for all of our conference rooms in Denver, Minneapolis, and Fargo, we have home plate that sits in the middle of our conference room. I played baseball here at Concordia. I'm a huge baseball fan and use a lot of baseball metaphors when I'm talking um, to the company. But simply put, home plate in baseball is where you start and it's where you want to come back to. For us at Sundog, the values are where we start and where we always come back to. Our values are how we make decisions. Our values are 
are what, li what lead us and who we hire our values uh, will in, are, are what guide us in, in um, mergers, um, any kind of acquisitions. Anything that we do, we start with values and we come back to values. You know, our mission has changed, our business has changed, the leadership has changed. The only thing that, our, that really hasn't changed in our company are our values. So when we look at building a culture of trust, uh, we start with our values. And um, I think one of the things that is often overlooked is um, values, if you're going to have a values-based organization, a values-based culture, values have to start with leadership. And the best story that I can give you is I've talked a lot about culture to a lot of organizations. We've had folks come into Sundog and, and, and I've talked to them. And m nine times out of 10, when we have groups come into Sundog and they want to learn about culture, um, what they will do is they will send somebody from um, human resources, they'll send somebody from service, they'll send somebody from quality and maybe somebody from um, you know, one of the other departments of the organization. And what I'll tell them is that, you know what, I'm, I'm happy to talk to you about this, but if you really want to change culture in your organization, go back and get your leaders and then come back to Sundog and then let's talk then. Because the values of the organization are driven by leadership. There's a book by Built, or it's called Built on Values by Ann Rhodes, and what she does is, I can save you the time in reading the book, but she makes this point so clear um, and in, in four points. So leaders drive values. So values have to start with leadership. It cannot start with somebody that in, in, in HR. It cannot start with somebody in customer service. Values have to start with leadership. So leaders def drive values. Values drive behavior. So if you think about that, it's just like parenting. Children will emulate the values or the, the, or the, the, the actions of their parents. The same thing will happen with employees. Um, the, the team members will see and they'll act the way leaders do. If leaders are saying things, if they're acting one way and doing, an, doing something else, if they're giving you half-truths or lies, uh, if, they're, you know, trying to, if they're trying to take the glory instead of giving the, the credit to the team, that's what team members are going to do ultimately. So leaders drive values. Values will drive those behaviors in the organization. Those behaviors are what define a culture. So all of those behaviors collectively define culture. And then ultimately, culture drives performance. It's such a simple equation, but I think we often overlook where, where culture starts. Um, you can't start culture in a meeting. You can't start culture at a company meeting. You can't start culture at an event. It has to start with leadership, and it has to start with those values. This is a, co uh, a study done by Modern Survey, which is a Minneapolis-based firm. This was done this year. Um, they, did, they, they surveyed 3,000 people. Out of the 3,000 people that they surveyed, a full two-thirds were either, they said they're, they're under-engaged or disengaged from their employer. Um, here's the reason. Um, it's ultimately what it comes down to is trust. So these are the top six reasons that they're, they're disengaged, um, or these are the top three, the top six things, another way to look at this, these are the top six things that drive engagement based on what the survey said. So when you look at this, number five, values drive behavior. So a lot of the time, what people were seeing, the reason that they were disengaged is because they saw leadership saying one thing and then doing another. But if you work your way all the way, if you work all the way up to the top of this, what you'll find is confidence in senior management is the number one driver of engagement. Just a little bit, tw twist that a little bit, and, and, and basically what you read is trust, right? Confidence in management means trust. Do I trust my management? Am I confident in them? If I, if I trust them, I have a high level of engagement, and if I don't, that engagement goes down. So. What does the right trust look like in a workplace? Um, we just, uh, Sundog and the executive team just wrapped up reading this book and I'd like to thank Dr. Dovery. He's uh, led a number of, of us uh, from uh, uh, ex-Cobbers through this. Um, it's been a really rewarding experience to go through this book, but it's a book by Patrick Lencioni and I would highly recommend it if you haven't read this yet. But it talks about healthy organizations and healthy organizations are simply, they're built on and based on trust. So what does that, that right trust look like in an, any organization? Um, and then how do you tie this back to your values? But first of all, trust is not predictive. So when I talk about giving trust away, what, this is exactly what I mean. Trust isn't predictive. In other words, I'm only going to give trust to you because I know you and you've worked here for four years. I can trust you. That's not what they're saying. What they're saying is that leaders have to create trust pockets. They have to give trust away to these individuals to allow them to be free and allow them to be fearless. It's genuinely given and genuinely received. And I love the word fearless. 
So do you have employees, do you have team members that are fearless? Do you support them? Do they have crazy ideas? And will you say, you know what, uh, you've only been here for six months, so no. Or do you say, you know what, I trust you enough, go ahead and do that. And that leads to that idea of building engagement one person at a time. I'm not saying you have to give everybody that has a crazy idea the opportunity to go out and do it, but I am saying those are those moments where you start to build trust. What does the tr right, what does right trust sound like? Um, it sounds like things like this. I screwed up, uh, I need help, your idea is better than mine. Trust is vulnerability based. Um, as a leader, you, you are the one that, you are the one that's setting the, uh, the culture, you're demonstrating the values, you're also showing them that you have some vulnerability. That, you know, once in a while, um, things are tough and, you know, I'm not, I don't always get things right and I, I need to be able to say, I'm sorry. So um, based on um, what we know about trust and what tr trust looks like, you know, I think it's also good to say, well, how do you lose that trust? If, 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 you're, if you're building it up, what can you do? And I think these things are pretty obvious, but nonetheless, uh, probably good to be reminded of. So act and speak and consistently do one thing, uh, say one thing and do another. Um, look for personal gain as opposed to giving credit to the team. As we all know, great leaders never take credit. They always find um, a way to give credit away. Withhold information, lie, and be closed-minded. Being closed-minded means I'm not really interested in your ideas. Uh, I'm more interested in making sure mine are implemented. So some lessons learned in building trust. Um, I talked about leadership demonstrating the values, um, learning how to give and take feedback considering an open book, open door policy. And I think, you know, where, when, we'll, we'll, I'll get into a little bit more about communication, but the idea of, of building trust is so, communication and FaceTime is so critical in that concept of, of, of building trust. So at Sundog, we have an uh, employee stock ownership program. Uh, there's a, uh, uh, obviously along with that, an open book policy, an open book strategy. We're very, very upfront. Even when there's bad news, you have to share the bad news. And I think people come, to, uh, to, uh, to recognize that and trust that, okay? All right, so um, we talked a little bit more about you know, these ideas of, of when does engagement happen in the organization. Um, we have, I have a couple great stories about just building that concept of trust and engagement. Um, we, uh, so there's a great quote by Harvard Business Reviews. You can see that, I don't know if you can read it, but it says, real engagement in the work work itself comes as a result of the trust you place in employees to take the right action using the right resources at their disposal, okay? We trust them to take the right action given what they have. What we do at Sundog is we put a lot of trust into really, uh, I think, innovative ideas, even what would probably would seem crazy ideas to most people. A couple of examples. Um, Craig is one of our engineers. Uh, at Sundog, when you start, you get a smartphone, you can get an iPhone, or you can get an Android phone, it's your pick. Craig um, is, uh, as I said, he's a really, he's a, he's a dreamer, um, one, of our best, one of our best engineers. He came to us and said, you know what, do you mind if I take a $600 smartphone and float it up into the air with helium balloons and see how far it can go? Um, I'm just interested. I've, wrote, I've written a little app that will take photos every 10 minutes. Those photos will send down, they'll send it down to my laptop and then I can see where this thing goes. And of course, most, I mean, you know, I think any rational person would say, no, that's a crazy idea, but we're not rational. So we said, sure, let's see where this goes. So he, he, he took his smartphone, it went up into the air. I think it went up, uh, I, I believe it was 80,000 feet in the air. It got caught in the jet stream, ended 43 miles west, ended up 43 miles uh, west of here near Valley City. What happened with that though, um, after um, he started posting some blogs about it and you know, put some information on Facebook is it got picked up by uh, DevCon, which is one of the world's largest software development conferences. Craig was asked to speak, one of the, one, be one of the key speakers at DevCon about what he did in this whole experience. So when we talk about giving trust away, uh, we talk about using resources at their disposal, this is just one of those ideas. Now Craig is, one of, is, is known as one of the key you know, he's our lead mobile developer, but the recognition that we got as a company just by Craig being able to do that was incredible. Um, there's a video here, but we're, because of time, I'm just gonna move past this. This is another, um, this is Danny. Danny's a, a writer. Um, she's uh, since moved out to San Francisco. She still contracts with us at the, t at the time. Danny 
came to me with a crazy idea, and she said, uh, we're a partner of Salesforce.com. Um, Salesforce.com CEO is Mark Benioff. Every year, in fact, next week, they have what they call Dreamforce, which is their annual conference. There are about 90,000 engineers and salespeople together in one facility, so if, if you can imagine the pain um, of having the, uh, uh, 90,000 people like that. But Danny came to me, and she, was, she came flying into my office with a big smile on her face, and if you know Danny, she's a hugger, and she likes to hug everybody. And so she came into my office, and she said, you know, I want to go to Dreamforce. And I said, well, wh why? And she said, well, I want to hug Mark Benioff. And I said, Danny, Mark Benioff has about three walls of security around him. There are 90,000 people. I don't think you're going to get to hug Mark Benioff. And she said, trust me, I will hug Mark Benioff. <laughs> so if you think about it, we send several people to Dreamforce every year because they're a key partner of ours, and we have a lot of clients that, we've, that we, that we um, uh, have worked or that we've uh, implemented Salesforce.com within their organization. So it's a, it's a big conference for us. We already send, you know, 15, 20 people there. Um, Danny wanted to go, and, you know, really Danny didn't have a role there. It was really hard for me to justify sending her, but at the end of the day, she kept pushing, and we said, yeah, go ahead. So what Danny did is started blogging and started tweeting about how she was going to hug Mark Benioff. She created a Twitter feed called Mission Hug Mark. <laughs> Mission Hug Mark got picked up by the Salesforce.com social team, and if you go to Dreamforce, their, their, their social um, intelligence center, they call it, looks a lot like a NASA, um, um, uh, NASA laboratory. So anyway, Mission Hug Mark got picked up by Salesforce. Um, after day one, uh, Mark Benioff himself retweeted one of Danny's tweets. On day two, after Mark's keynote, Danny hugged Mark. So here you got a guy with three walls of security, you got 90,000 people. Danny finally met Mark and she said, hey, I'm Danny, I'm the one that wants to hug you. And Mark just lit up and he said, well then we better hug. <laughs> so we have this picture of Danny and Mark and this was retweeted, retweeted throughout all of, of, of that, of, uh, of, of uh, salesforce.com and a lot of the salesforce.com attendees. So 90,000 people. Mark Benioff's Twitter account, I mean I think he has probably I don't know, millions of followers, I would guess. The point is, is that by doing something crazy, by giving trust away, um, we did some analysis and we found that there were 90,000 people that came to our website just to follow what happened with Danny. 90,000 people that didn't know of Sundog before any of this. So that's when we talk about giving trust away, that's what we talk about. When I talk about engagement happening one person at a time, that's what I mean. It's just Danny's engaged, Craig is engaged, and they know we trust them to do something crazy. And they, it may work, it may not work, but at least they know we trust them. So trust leads to engagement. Um, trust is a requirement for engagement. I think I've made that point abundantly clear. But the best, result le best results leaders build trust first. And what that means is that basically uh, what we just did with Danny and Mark, you build those pockets of trust. You know, you build those, whether it's a department or whether you do it um, in a one-on-one -on -one meeting with somebody o over a cup of coffee or, or, or whatever, you just build that, that, that pocket of trust where they know that they can come to you with a crazy idea like that. Believing you're trusted affects engagement. Danny believes she's trusted. Craig believes and others believe they're trusted. That affects their, their, their level of engagement with the organization. Some lessons learned. I'm going to try to wrap up here. Um, so FaceTime and communication just reinforces that connectedness. I can't um, um, reinforce that enough, that the idea of getting in front of your folks constantly, whether that be through stand-up meetings or lunches. I have crunch breakfasts that where I meet with my teams individually on a regular basis. We do um, company meetings. I am constantly emailing them. And we, do, we have a, a, a Sundog podcast. There is no replacement for that constant communication from the leader of the organization to continually build that trust, deliver those messages, good or bad, um, and uh, in supporting those crazy ideas. So um, the one video I'll show you today, and then um, we'll, we'll try to I'll wrap up. Um, it's easier to give trust away when you know who you're hiring. I think we can all agree with that. We have worked really hard at understanding how we hire, who we hire, what questions we need to ask. Um, so we have three rounds. The first round if, is a culture interview, and if you don't pass the culture interview, you don't go on to the second or third round. So culture in our, our mind 
is the most important thing. It's really helped us uh, become more efficient with the interview process. But we also think that if you make it past that culture interview, then you get to the skills interview, and then ultimately the third round is the values assessment. So that's a values interview. And if you get through all those, then there's a likely chance that you'll get a job offer. But we know who we're hiring. We feel really, really good about who we're hiring. Um, and therefore, we're more likely to give trust away because even if you've been with us for three months, we know who you are and we know what your values are. Um, this is, uh, uh, I, I will show you a quick video. Um, I wanted to know if we were right. I wanted to know if the questions were right. And so what, what I did is I asked four people who had been with the organization for less than six months. I said, I want you to develop a video. Just shoot a video. Show me what our culture is to you. Um, no limit. Just show me what you think our culture means um, and, and your perception of it. And these folks had been with us, like I said, for six months. Now granted, the video you're gonna see is pretty well done because they're professionals at it. Um, but I think what, um, what I found was that, uh, you know, by doing a random test just to see whether or not um, the people that we're hiring, one, have our values, understand our values, and then believe in our culture, um, it led me to, uh, uh, I think, it, I guess it gave me confirmation that what we're doing is right. And I'll just show you that video real quick right now. There's an art to making stories come to life, to thinking big in a way that moves people, shakes them, surprises them, inspires them. Our artists are analysts, editors, writers, designers, and developers. Empowering brands like Stanford, Medtronic, Bobcat, Anderson, United Healthcare, and Schwann. It's success that lies in a sweet spot at the intersection of marketing and technology, where ideas fuel results. Faith fuels imagination. Growth fuels greatness. With passion for process, progress, and changing the game. It's quality people and quality work. It's what we do, how we do it, and why we do it. With consistency, honesty, and hard work. With fun, because that's how it is when you love what you do. When you are ready to think big, think Sundog. So, um... I was really, really impressed, and obviously I felt very, very good about what they had done. In fact, so good that we put that on our website, and it's still there today. Um, <clears throat> so there are multiple ways that you can measure this and there are multiple ways that you can test this. But what we do, we have a, something called the stiff test. This is the first. This is the culture test. So w when, uh, when, when uh, our talent coordinator interviews you, you'll get questions like that, that focus on strengths. An example of this, um, you'd say, well, what's a question to get to whether or not somebody's friendly? And one example would be, tell me about the last, tell me about the best conversation you've had with a stranger. You know, and, and, and many people just have a hard time because they don't talk to strangers. And then that leads to, well, you know, are you really, are you, are you really uh, interested in, in, in being part of a team? Are you inclusive or, you know, so you can kind of start to see some patterns. Um, then we do the values assessment and uh, we have a number of questions on that. Finally, hiring, <coughs> I'm sorry, measuring. So we, we do measure culture, we measure engagement. We have uh, quarterly engagement surveys that focus on trust, that focus on autonomy, that focus on mastery, that focus on purpose. We, they're random, they're only five questions. We also um, are right now developing an, an app for an iPad. We'll have iPads on the exits on every floor in Denver, in, in Minneapolis and in Fargo that are gonna ask you simple questions like, did you get to use your expertise today? Thumbs up, thumbs down. So as they're walking out, they hit thumbs up or thumbs down. Um, you can ask, did you have fun today? You know, think about the ideas, that, uh, the questions, simple questions you can ask to get, a w uh, to, to get a measurement of real time, real time engagement. Are these people really having fun today? And if overwhelmingly people are thumbs down, then we obviously have high levels of stress. Doesn't necessarily mean um, immediately high, high levels of disengagement, but certainly high levels of stress and something that we need to watch. We also look at how much we spend on culture. Um, 
and as a percentage of our budget, it's about equal to that, which you spend on technology. So it's between three and 5%. And over the years, we've increased that. We look at the number of people that are applying for jobs. Typically, uh, four years ago, we'd have 10 people apply per job. Now we have probably 150 people apply per position. So all of those things are measurements, and certainly the one measurement that we look at is profitability. Uh, and there's no question when you look at our bottom line and you look at the growth of the organization that culture's had a big, big, big impact. So um, one thing that you might want to do is go to this website. There are two surveys that you could do. That you, could, you could look at one measures uh, culture in the workplace. The other one measures trust in the workplace. I would highly suggest you check that out. It's uh, Great Places to Work. If you go to Great Places to Work, it'll lead you to the survey. Um, and there's just finally some lessons learned, you know, setting benchmarks and assessing, just making sure you understand. So if you want to really truly measure engagement and trust, then I think you need to, you know, develop questions. They don't need to be, they don't need to be complicated, just very, very simple questions, but do that on a more of a, more than an annual basis. Why it matters, the big, the, this is what I call the money slide for those of you um, who are interested in measurements and metrics, which I am. Um, the one thing on here that I always go back to, those who work in um, organizations that have high levels of trust and high levels of engagement um, are always more profitable, and particularly those who are highly engaged spend twice the amount of time on task. So for any business owner who looks at that and says, if I can, if I can get somebody to spend twice the amount of time on task, you can quickly figure out the math and what that will do to your bottom line. Um, the last slide I would just leave you with, um, just some summary points. Uh, it, it all starts with leadership, and you, you would have a hard time convincing me otherwise that um, values start with the leaders, and leaders demonstrate those values. It's about authenticity and vulnerability. For the, there to be real trust, you have to be vulnerable. You have to show them that you do have your warts. Um, trust drives engagement. Engagement will ultimately drive trust. And I always say um, that you can't fix culture overnight. It does take time. And in our case, I believe it, it took about three years to kind of get to where we are now. And if nothing else, if you don't know anywhere else to start, I always say just start with the golden rule and treat your folks as you would want to be treated yourself. So. I will end there. Sorry I went a little late, but I'm happy to answer some questions. Thank you. Any? They're all, you, you're all just still depressed from my first three <laughs> slides. If not, it's 10 after, so. I think this goes till quarter two, but I'll stick around if uh, anybody has anything and you can stop by and, and um, be happy to um, answer anything I can. But thank you again for coming. I really appreciate your time and uh, have a good uh, weekend, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> just, just quickly before we go. Um, there is uh, information there about our next event, which I think is on the 13th of December. Again, what a, a special thanks uh, to Brent for today and for everyone else who, who's making this a regular part of uh, what we do here in the Offutt School. So thanks very much. Enjoy a beautiful day. Uh, what do we say? Sunny and 60 every day in Moorhead. For those from the Fargo side, I know you're not used to such good weather, so come and visit us again. <laughs>